is the Brief History Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Knight, and thank you for downloading this episode titled The Armenian Genocide. As always, any new podcast relies on the generosity of its listeners. Please like, share, leave a review. Find us on all the major social networks, Facebook forward slash Brief History Podcast, Twitter at B History Podcast. In this podcast, we will talk about the Ottoman government's systematic extermination of 1.5 million Armenians, mostly within the Ottoman Empire and the successor state of the Republic of Turkey. The Ottoman authorities rounded up and arrested and deported from Constantinople to the region of Ankara. 235 to 270 Armenian intellectuals and community leaders, the majority of whom were eventually murdered. This genocide was carried out during the World War I and implemented in two phases. It consisted of the wholesale killing of able bodied male populations through massacre and subjection of army conscripts to forced labour followed by the deportation of women and children, the elderly, infirm, on death marches leading to the Syrian desert. They were driven forward by military escorts. The door porties were deprived of food and water and were subject to periodic robbery, rape and massacre. Other ethnic groups were similarly targeted for extermination in the Assyrian Genocide and the Greek Genocide, and their treatment is considered by some historians to be part of the same genocidal policy. Raphael Lemkin was moved specifically by the analysation of the Armenians to define the systematic and premeditated exterminations with legal parameters and coined the word genocide in 1943. The Armenian Genocide is acknowledged to have been one of the first modern genocides because scholars point to the organised manner in which the killings were carried out. It is the second most studied case of genocide after the Holocaust. Turkey denies the word genocide is an accurate term for these crimes. In recent years, Turkey has been faced with repeated calls to reorganise or recognise them as genocide. As of 2018, 29 countries officially recognised the mass killing as genocide, as has most genocide scholars and historians. The western portion of historical Armenia, known as Western Armenia, has come under Ottoman jurisdiction by the Peace of Moisea, 1555, and was permanently divided from Eastern Armenia by the Treaty of Zuhab. 1639. Thereafter, the region was alternatively referred to as Turkish or Ottoman Armenia. The vast majority of Armenians were grouped together into a semi-autonomous community, the Armenian Millet, which is led by one of the spiritual heads of the Armenian Apostolic Church, the Armenian Patriarch of Constantinople. Armenians were mainly concentrated in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, although large communities were also found in the eastern provinces as well as the capital Constantinople. The Armenian community was made up of three religious denominations, Armenian Catholic, Armenian Protestant, and Armenian Apolitistic. The church the vast majority of Armenians. Under the millet system, Armenian community was allowed to rule itself under its own system of governance, with fairly little interference from the Ottoman government. Most Armenians, approximately 70%, lived in poor and dangerous conditions in rural countryside, with the exception of the wealthy Constantinople-based Amira class, a social elite whose members included the Duzans, directors of the Imperial Mint, the Balians, chief imperial architects, and the Dadians, superintendents of the gunpowder mills and manager of industrial factories. Ottoman census figures clash with statistics collected by the Armenian 
patriarchate, but according to the latter, there's almost 3 million Armenians living in the empire in 1878. 400,000 of these in Constantinople and 600,000 in the Balkans in East Asia Minor and Cilicia. 6,700 in Lesser Armenia and the area near Kursiri and 1.3 million in, East, in Western Armenia. In the eastern provinces, the Armenians were subject to the whims of their Turkish and Kurdish neighbours who would be regularly overtaxing them, subject to brigandage and kidnapping, forcing them to convert to Islam and otherwise exploit them without interference from central or local authorities. In the Ottoman Empire, in accordance with Dimi system, implemented in Muslim countries, they all, they like all other Christians and also Jews, were accorded certain freedoms. The Dimi system in the Ottoman Empire was largely based on the Pact of Umar. The client status established the rights of non-Muslims to property, livelihood and freedom of worship, but they were in essence treated as second-class citizens in the empire and referred to in Turkish as gavors, a pejorative word meaning infidel or unbeliever. The clause of the Pact of Umar which prohibited non-Muslims from building new palaces of worship, was historically imposed on some communities of the Ottoman Empire and ignored other cases at the discretion of local authorities. Although there were no laws mandating religious ghettos, this led to non-Muslim communities being clustered around existing houses of worship. In addition to other legal limitations, Christians were not considered equal to Muslims and several prohibitions were placed upon them. Testimony against Muslims by Christians and Jews were inadmissible in courts of law, wherein a Muslim could be punished. This meant that their testimony could only be considered in commercial cases. They were forbidden to carry weapons or ride atop horses and camels. Their houses could not overlook those of Muslims and their religious practices were severely circumscribed. The ringing of church bell was strictly forbidden. In the mid-19th century, the three major European powers, Great Britain, France and Russia, began to question the Ottoman Empire's treatment of its Christian minorities and pressure it to grant equal rights to all its subjects. From 1839 to the declaration of the constitution in 1876, the Ottoman government instituted the Tanzimat and a series of reforms designed to improve the status of minorities. Nevertheless, most of the reforms were never implemented because the empire's Muslim population rejected the principle of equality for Christians. By the late 1870s, the Greeks, along with seven, several other Christian nations in the Balkans, frustrated with their conditions and offered off them with the help of Entente powers, broke free of Ottoman rule. The Armenians remained by large passive during these years, earning them the title of Millet Eskaduki, or the Lawyer Millet. In, May, in, the, in mid 1860s and early 1870s, this passivity gave way to new currents of thinking in Armenian society. Led by intellectuals educated at European universities or American mystery schools in Turkey, Armenians began to question their second class status and press for better treatment from their government. In one such instance, after amassing the signatures of peasants from Western Armenia, the Armenian Communal Council petitioned the Ottoman government to redress their principal grievances. The looting and murder in Armenian towns by Muslims, Kurds and cessations, improprieties during tax collection, criminal behaviour by government officials and the refusal to accept Christians as witnesses in trial. The Ottoman government considered these grievances and promised to punish those responsible, but no meaningful steps to, to do so were ever taken. Following the violent suppression of Christians during the Great Eastern Crisis, particularly in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria and Serbia, the United Kingdom and France invoked the 1856 Treaty of Paris by claiming that it gave them the right to interfere 
and protect the Ottoman Empire's Christian minorities. Under growing pressure, the government of Sultan Abdul Hamid II declared itself a constitutional monarchy with a parliament, which was almost immediately prorogued and entered into negotiations with the powers. At the same time, the Armenian Patriarch of Constantinople, Nurses II, forwarded Armenian complaints of widespread quote, forced land seizures, forced conversion of women and children, arson, protection, extortion, rape and murder, end quote, to the powers. The russian turku War of 1877 to 78 ended with Russia's decisive victory and its army and occupation of large parts of Turkey, but not before the entire Armenian districts had been devastated by massacres carried out with the convenience of Ottoman authorities. In the wake of these events, Patriarch nurses had his emissaries made repeated approaches to Russian leaders to urge the inclusion of clause granted local self-government to the Armenians in a form coming Treaty of San Stefano, which was signed on the 3rd of March 1878. The Russians were receptive and drew up the clause, but the Ottomans flatly rejected it during negotiations. In its place, the suicides agreed on a clause marking the sublime port's implementation of reforms in the Armenian provinces, a condition of Russia's withdrawal, thus designating Russia the guarantee of reforms. The clause entered the treaty as Article 16 and marked the first appearance what became to be known in European diplomacy as the Armenian Question. On receiving a copy of the treaty, Britain promptly objected to it, and particularly Article 16, which is saw as a seed in too much influence to Russia. It immediately pushed for progress of the great powers to be convened to discuss and revise the treaty, leading to the Congress of Berlin in June-July 1878. Patriarch nurses sent a delegation led by his distinguished predecessor, Archbishop Karim Hyrik, to speak for the Armenians, but it was not admitted into the sessions on the grounds that it did not represent a country. Confined to the periphery, the delegation did its best to contact the representatives of the powers and argue the case for Armenian administrative autonomy within the Ottoman Empire, but to little effect. Following an understanding reached with the Ottoman representatives, Britain drew up an escalated version of Article 16 to replace the original, a clause that retained the call for reforms but omitted any reference to Russian occupation, thereby dispensing with principal guarantee of their implementation. Despite an ambiguous reference to great power supervision, the clause failed to offset the removal of the Russian guarantee with any tangible equivalent, thus leaving the timing and fate of the reforms to the discretion of the sublime port. The clause was readily adopted on the Article 61 of the Treaty of Berlin on the last day of the Congress, 13th of July 1878, to the deep disappointment of the Armenian delegation. Prospects for reforms faded rapidly following the signing of the Berlin Treaty as security conditions in the Armenian provinces went from bad to worse and abuses proliferated. Upset with this turn of events, a number of disillusioned Armenian intellectuals living in Europe and Russia decided to form political parties and societies dedicated to the betterment of their compatriots in the Ottoman Empire. In the last quarter of the 19th century, this movement became dominated by three parties. The Emir Khan, whose influence was limited to Van, the Social De Democratic Hukatanian Party and the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. Ideological differences aside, all parties had the common goal of achieving better social conditions for the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire through self-defence and advocating increased European pressure on the Ottoman government to implement promised reforms.
Soon after the Treaty of Berlin was signed, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, 1876-1909, attempted to forestall the implementation of its reforms provisions by asserting that Armenians did not make up a majority in the provinces and that their reports of abuse was largely exaggerated or false. In 1890, Abdul Hamid created a, parliament, a paramilitary outfit known as Hamidai, which was mostly made up of Kurdish irregulars tasked to deal with the Armenians as they wished. As Ottoman officials intentionally provoked rebellions, often as a result of overtaxation in Armenian population towns such as Susan in 1894 and Zitun in 1895-96. Those regiments were increasingly used to deal with the Armenians by way of oppression and massacre. In some instances, Armenians successfully fought off the regiments in 1895 brought the excesses to the attention of the great powers who subsequently condemned the port. In May 1895, the powers forced Abdul Hamid to sign a new reform package designed to curtail the powers of the Hamadouki, yet like the Berlin Treaty, it was never implemented. On the 1st of October 1895, 2,000 Armenians assembled in Constantinople to petition for implementation of the reforms, but Ottoman police units violently broke through the rally. Soon massacres of Armenians broke out in Constantinople, then engulfed the rest of the Armenian populated provinces of Bitlis, Diabukha, Erzurum, Harput, Savas, Trabzon and Van. Estimates differ on how many Armenians were killed, but European documentation of the pogroms, which became known as the Humadian massacres, placed the figure at between 100 and 300,000. Although Hamid was never directly implicated, it was believed that the massacres had his tacit approval. Frustrated with European indifference to the massacres, a group of members of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation seized a European-managed Ottoman bank on the 26th of August 1896. This incident brought further sympathy for Armenians in Europe and was lauded by the European-American press, which vilified Hamid and paid him as, quote, great assassin, bloody sultan, and Abdur the damned, unquote. The great powers vowed to take action and enforce new reforms, which never came to fruition due to conflicting political and economic interests. On the 24th of July 1908, Armenians' hopes for equality in the Ottoman Empire brightened when a coup d'etat staged by officers in the Ottoman Third Army based in Salinka removed Abdul Hamid II from power and restored the country to a constitutional monarchy. The officers were part of the Young Turk movement that wanted reform administration of the perceived decadent state of the Ottoman Empire and modernise it to European standards. The movement was anti-Hamidian coalition made up of two distinct groups, the liberal constitutionalists and nationalists. The former were more democratic in accepting of Armenians, whereas the latter were less tolerant of Armenians and their frequent requests for European assistance. In 1902, during the Congress of the Young Turks held in Paris, the heads of the Liberal wing, Sabah Hadin and Ahmed Riza Bey, particularly persuaded nationalists to include their objectives ensuring some rights for all minor minorities of the empire. One of the numerous factions within the Young Turk movement was a secret revolutionary organisation called the Committee of Union Progress, the CUP. It drew its membership from disaffected army officers based in Salinka and was behind the wave of mutinies against the central government. In 1908, elements of the Third Army and the Second, second Army Corps declared their opposition to the Sultan and threatened to march on the capital to, to dispose him. Hamid, shaken by a wave of resentment, stepped down from power as Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians, Arabs, Bulgarians and Turks alike rejoiced in his dethronement.
counter coup took place in early 1909, ultimately resulting in the 31st of March incident on the 13th of April 1909. This was the massacre at dinner. Some re reactionary Ottoman military elements joined by Islamic theological students aimed to return control to the country, to the Sultan and the rule of Islamic law. Riots and fighting broke out between the revolutionary forces and the CUP forces until the CUP were able to put down the uprising and court-martial the opposition leaders. While the government initially targeted the young Turk government, it spilled over into programs against the Armenians who were perceived as having supported the restoration of the constitution. About 4,000 Turkish civilians and soldiers participated in the rampage. Estimates of the number of Armenians killed in the course of Adana massacre range from 15,000 up to 30,000 people. In 1912, the First Balkan War broke out and ended with the defeat of the Ottoman Empire as well as the loss of 85% of its European territory. Many in the empire saw this defeat as Allah's divine punishment for a society that did not know how to pull itself together. The Turkish nationalist movement in the country gradually came to view Anatolia as the last refuge. The Armenian population formed a significant minority in this region. An important consequence of the Balkan, Balkans war was also the mass expulsion of Muslims from the Balkans. From the beginning of the mid-19th century, hundreds of thousands of Muslims, including Turks, Caesarians and Chechens, were forcibly expelled and others voluntarily migrated from the Corsicas and the Balkans as a result of the Russo-Turkish Wars, the Caesarian genocide and the conflicts in the Balkans. Muslim society in the empire was incensed by this flood of refugees. A journal published in Constantinople expressed the mood of the times, quote, let this be a warning, O Muslims, don't get comfortable. Do not let your blood cool before taking a revenge. End quote. As many as 850,000 of these refugees were settled in the area where the Armenians resided. This escalated the status of their relatively well-off neighbours, as historian Tana Akam and others have noted. Some of those came to play a pivotal role in the killings of the Armenians and the confiscation of their properties during the genocide. On the 2nd of November 1914, the Ottoman Empire opened the Middle Eastern theater of World War I by entering hostilities on the side of the Central Powers against the Allies. The battles of the Caucasus Campaign, the Persian Campaign and the Gallipoli Campaign affected several populous Armenian centers. Before entering the war, the Ottoman government had sent representatives to the Armenian Congress at Erzurum to persuade Ottoman Armenians to facilitate its conquest of Transcaucasia by inciting an insurrection of Russian Armenians against the Russian army in the event of a Caucasus front, which were opened. On the 24th of December 1914, Minister of War Enver Pasha implemented a plan to encircle and destroy the Russian Corsicus army at Sarakamish in order to regain territories lost to Russia after the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78. Enver Pasha's forces were routed in the battle and also almost completely destroyed. Returning to Constantinople, Enver Pasha publicly blamed his defeat on Armenians in the region having actively sided with the Russians. In November 1914, Shakur or Aslam proclaimed she had holy war against the Christians. This was later used as a factor to provoke radical masses in the implementation of the Armenian genocide. On the 25th of February 19. 15, Ottoman General Staff released the War Minister's Enver Pasha's Directive 8682 on increased security and precautions 
to all military units calling for the removal of all ethnic Armenians serving in the Ottoman forces from their posts and for their demobilisation. They were assigned to the unarmed labour battalions. The directive accused the Armenian Patriarchate of releasing state secrets to the Russians. Enver Pasha explained this decision out of fear that they would collaborate with the Russians. Traditionally, the Ottoman army only drafted non-Muslim males between ages of 20 to 45 into the regular army. The younger men, 15 to 20 and older, 45 to 60 non-Muslim soldiers had always been used as logistical support throughout the labour battalions. Before February, some of the Armenian recruits were utilised as labourers, though they were ultimately executed. Transferring Armenian conscripts from active combat to passive unarmed logistics sections was an important pr precursor to the subsequent genocide. As reported in the memoirs of Nayan Bey, the execution of the Armenians in these battalions were part of a premeditated strategy of the CUP. Many of these Armenian recruits were executed by local Turkish gangs. On the 19th of April 1915, Jedvet Bey demanded the city of Van immediately furnish him 4,000 soldiers under the pretext of conscription. However, it was clear the Armenian population that his goal was to massacre the able-bodied men of Van so that there would be no defenders. Jet Bet Bay had already used his official writ in nearby villages, ostensibly to search for arms, but in fact to initiate hostile massacres. The Armenians offered 500 soldiers and exemption money for the rest in order to buy time. But Jedver Bey accused the Armenians of rebellion and asserted his de determination to crush it at all costs. Quote, if the rebels fire a single shot, he declared, I shall cut every Christian man, woman and, pointing to his knee, every child up to here. End quote. The next day, the 25th of April 1915, the siege of Van began when an Armenian woman was harassed and two Armenian men who came to her aid were killed by Ottoman soldiers. The Armenian defenders protected the 30,000 residents and 15,000 refugees living in the area, area roughly one square kilometre of the Armenian quarter and suburb of Agistan with 1,500 able-bodied riflemen who were supplied with 300 rifles, 1,000 pistols and antique weapons. The conflict lasted until General Yundirik of Russia came to their rescue. Reports of the conflict reached then United States Ambassador to the Ottoman Emperor Henry Mortegundu Sr. from Aleppo and Bam prompted him to raise an issue to person with Alalet and Enver, as he quoted to them the testimonies of his consulted officials. They justified the deportations and necessary to the conduct of war, suggesting that complicity of the Armenians of Van with the Russian forces that had taken the city justified the persecution of all ethnic Armenians. By the 1914, Ottoman authorities had already begun a propaganda drive to present Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire as a threat to the Empire's security. An Ottoman naval officer in the war office described the planning, quote, In order to justify this enormous crime, the requisite propaganda material was thoroughly repaired in Istanbul. It included such statements as, The Armenians are in league with the enemy. They will launch an uprising in, in Istanbul, kill off the interdist leaders and will succeed in opening the straits of the Dardanelles. End quote. On the 9th of the 23rd to 24th of April 1915, known as Red Sunday, the Ottoman government rounded up and imprisoned an estimated 250 Armenian intellectuals and community leaders of the Ottoman capital, Constantinople, and later those in other centres who were moved to the two holding centres, Nida and Kara. 
This date coincided with Allied troops landing at Gallipoli after unsuccessful Allied naval attempts to break through to, to the Dardanelles to Constantinople in February and March 1915. Following the passage of Tenkir law on the 29th of May 1915, the Armenian leaders, except for the few who were able to return to Constantinople, were gradually deported and assassinated. The date, the 24th of April, is commemorated as Genocide Remembrance Day by Armenians around the world. In May 1915, Mehmet Talat Pasha requested that the cabinet and the Grand Visor Saad Halim Pasha legalise a measure for the deportation of the Armenians to other places due to what Talat Pasha called, quote, the Armenian riots and massacres which had risen in a number of places in the country, end quote. However, Talat Pasha was referring specifically to events in Van and extending the implementation to the regions in which alleged riots and massacres would affect the scrutiny of the war zone of the Caucasus campaign. Later in the scope of the deportation was widened in order to include the Armenians in other provinces. On the 29th of May 1915, the CUP Central Committee passed the temporary law of deportation, giving the Ottoman government a military authorization to deport anyone it sense has a threat to national security. With the implementation of this law, the confiscation of Armenian property and the slaughter of Armenians that ensured upon its enactment outraged much of the Western world. While the Ottoman Empire's wartime allies offered little pro protest, a while for German and Austrian historical documents has since come to attest to the witnesses' horror at the killings and mass starvations of Armenians. In the United States, the New Yorker Times reported almost daily on the mass murder of the Armenian people, describing the process as, quote, systematic, authorised and organised by the government, end quote. Theodore Roosevelt would later characterise this as, quote, the greatest crime of the war, end quote. Historian Hans Lucas Kaiser stated that, the statements of the Talabat Pasha and it's clear that the officials were aware of the deportation order was genocidal. Another historian, Tana Akam, states that the telegrams show that the overall coordination of the genocide was taken over by Talat Pasha. In 2017, Akam was able to access one of the original telegrams archived in Jerusalem, which inquired about Armenian liquidation and elimination. The Armenians were marched out to the Syrian town of Deir el-Zor and the surrounding desert. The Ottoman government deliberately withheld the facilities and supplies that would be necessary to sustain the likes of hundreds of thousands of Armenian deportees during and after their forced march to the Syrian desert. By August 1915, the New York Times repeated an unattributed uh, report that, quote, the roads and Euphrates were strewn with corpses of exiles, and those who survived were doomed to certain death. It is plain to exterminate the whole Armenian people, end quote. Talat Pasha and Dalmar Pasha were completely aware that by abandoning the Armenian deportees in the desert, they were condemning them to certain death. A dispatch from a high diplomatic source in Turkey, not America, reporting the testimony of worthy, trustworthy witnesses about the plight of Armenian deportees in northern Arabia and the lower Euphrates Valley was extensively quoted in the New York Times in August 1916. Quote, the witnesses have seen thousands of deported Armenians under tents in the open, in caravans on the march, descending the river in boats, and in all phases of their miserable life. Only in a few places did the government issue rations, and those were quite insufficient. The people there for themselves are forced to satisfy their hunger with food baked in that scanty land or found in the parched fields. Naturally, the date 
death rate from the starvation and sickness is very high and it is increased by the brutal treatment of the, author of the authorities whose bearing towards the exiles as they were driven back and forth over the desert is not unlike that of slave drivers. With few exceptions, no shelter for any kind is provided and the people coming from a cold climate are left under the scorching desert sun without food and water. Temporary relief can only be obtained by a few able to pay officials. End quote. Similarly, Major General Frederick Freer Kress van Kresatijn noted quote, that the Turkish population of causing starvation nor to obvious proof it is proof that it is still needed of those who is responsible for the massacre for the Turkish resolve to destroy the Armenians end quote German engineers and labourers involved in building the railway also witnessed Armenians being crammed into the cattle cars and shipped along the railroad, railroad line Franz Gunther, a representation, representative of the Deutsche Bank, which was funding the construction of the Baghdad Railway, forwarded photographs to his directors and expressed his frustration at having to remain silent amid such bestial cruelty. Major General Otto van Losso, acting military attaché and head of the German military plenitary in the Ottoman Empire, spoke to Ottoman intentions in a conference held in Bhutan in 1918. Quote, the Turks have embarked upon the total extermination of the Armenians in trans corsicosia the aim of Turkish policy is, as I have reiterated, the taking of possessions of the Armenian districts and the extermination of the Armenians. Talat's government wants to destroy all Armenians, not just in Turkey, but also outside Turkey. On the basis of all these reports and news coming to me here in Telifs, there's hardly any doubt that the Turks systematically are aiming to extermination of the few hundred thousand Armenians who they left alive until now. End quote. Rape was an integral part of the genocide. Military commanders told their men, quote, to do the women whatever they wished, end quote, resulting in widespread sexual abuse. Deportees were displayed naked in Damascus and sold as sex slaves in some areas, including Mosul, the consul report of the German consul there, constituting an important source of income for accompanying soldiers. Dr. Walter Rosler, the German consul in Aleppo, during their jo the genocide, heard from a dejected Armenian that around a quarter of young women, whose appearance were more or less pleasing, were regularly raped by their gender arms, and that even more beautiful ones were violated by 10 to 15 men. This resulted in girls and women being left behind dying. A network of 25 concentration camps was set up by the Ottoman government to dispose of Armenians who have survived the deportation to their ultimate point. This network, situated in the region of Turkey's present-day borders with Iraq and Syria, were directed by Sukhra Karya, one of Talat Pasha's right-hand men. Some of the camps only temporary transit points. Others, such as Rajo, Katma and Azam, were briefly used as mass graves and then vacated by autumn 1915. Camps such as Leo, Chafija, Dipsy, Dal, El and Rasa An were specifically built for those whose life expectancy was just a few days. According to genocide scholar Helmut Kaiser, the Ottoman authorities refused to provide food and water to the victims, increasing the mortality rate. According to the Oxford Handbook of Genocidal Studies, Muslims were eager, eager to obtain Armenian women. Authorities registered such marriages but did not record the deaths of the former Armenian husbands. Brenu, an American citizen of German descent, travelled to the area where Armenians were incarcerated and wrote a report that was deemed factual by Rosler, the German consul at Aleppo. He reports mass graves containing over 60,000 people in Mesken and large numbers of mounds of corpses, corpse, as the Armenians died due to hunger and disease. 
who reported seeing 450 orphans who received almost 150 grams of bread per day in a vent in a tent of five to six square meters dysentery swept through the camp and days passed between the instances of distribution of bread in some in abu Huraira near miskin he described how the guards let 240 armenians starve and wrote that they searched horse droppings for grain thank you for listening to part one the armenian genocide please share with your friends find us on social media twitter is be history podcast facebook.com forward slash brief history podcast i'm your host andrew knight please listen again please review and tell a friend listen out for episode two which will be released shortly thank you Thank <laughs> you.